Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sujit Chowdhury, and it is my privilege to hold the Michael Heyman Professorship at Berkeley, and I am also the Dean of Berkeley Law. Um, it is another beautiful day in Berkeley today, which makes it a particularly appropriate occasion for our community to come together and honor former Berkeley Law Dean and Professor Emeritus Sanford Kadish, a beloved member of the Berkeley Law community. We are here to offer a tribute and to celebrate his life and to acknowledge his immense contributions to Berkeley and to legal education. Equally significant has been the impact that Sandy had on the many lives he touched. I am grateful to have Peter and Josh Kadish here with their families as we honor our dear friend and colleague. When I think of Sandy, I think of what it means to be a scholar. For Sandy, to be a scholar was much more than to have a job. To be a scholar was much greater than to pursue or profess a profession or even a calling. For Sandy, to be a scholar was to choose a way of life, the life of the mind. In many ways, Sandy was our leader. His passing has reminded us that in a very concrete way, we are the law school that Sandy created. We miss him every day. Sandy joined the Berkeley Law faculty in 1964 and served as dean from 1975 to 1982. He was the driving force behind the school's pioneering jurisprudence and social policy, JSP, program, a unique PhD degree program that teaches students to analyze legal concepts in institutions within the framework of disciplines such as economics, history, and sociology. Launched in 1978, the JSP program was the first and only PhD program of its kind housed within a law school. When Berkeley's School of Criminology dissolved in 1975, Sandy and his colleague Philip Selznick drafted plans for this PhD program, as well as an undergraduate program in legal studies. Selznick had also founded the Center for the Study of Law and Society, and Sandy would often say that that center was part of the reason he was drawn to this campus. So great were Sandy's contributions to the JSP program and the Center for the Study of Law and Society that in November 2012, Sandy was honored at a ceremony that named the library in his name. That library houses books and journals that focus on the intersection of law, social sciences, and humanities, including many authored by scholars that Sandy has mentored throughout his extraordinary career. Sandy was born in 1921 and grew up in the Bronx. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa from City College of New York. He then attended Japanese language school in Colorado. As a Navy officer during World War II, Sandy worked on a destroyer in the Pacific translating Japanese military documents. After graduating from Columbia Law School in 1948, he practiced law for three years in New York before a friend from language school enlisted him to help start a law school at the University of Utah. Sandy taught at Utah for 10 years and then moved to the University of Michigan Law School before finally landing at Berkeley. During his distinguished academic career, Sandy was a Guggenheim Fellow, a visiting professor at Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, Cambridge, and many other prestigious institutions abroad. He received honorary doctorates from the City University of New York and Cologne University. Sandy also served as president of both the American Association of University Professors and the Association of American Law Schools, and as vice president of the American Academy of Arts and Science. He was editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Crime and Justice, and his books include Discretion to Disobey, which he wrote in 1973 with his brother, Mortimer Kadish, a philosophy professor at Case Western who passed away in 2010. 
Despite his many responsibilities, Sandy always made time for his colleagues and friends of all generations. And he was a generous and supportive mentor to generations of new law students. In 2000, Sandy and his wife June conceived of and endowed Berkeley's Kadish Center for Morality, Law, and Public Affairs to help probe the theoretical, multidisciplinary, and moral aspects of criminal law. Sandy was married for 68 years to June, who passed away in March 2011. His two sons, Josh Kadish of Portland and Peter Kadish of Orem, Utah, plus seven grandchildren and three great-grandchildren, along with other family members, are present with us here today. Thank you very much for coming. I'd like to begin our proceedings today by welcoming Josh Kadish to the podium. Josh followed his father's footsteps into the field of law. He practices family law, mediation, estate planning, and business law with Wise Kadish. He has been an adjunct professor at the Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark for over 20 years. He resides in, the Hillsdale, in Hillsdale, Oregon with his wife, Lisa Moss. Josh. Thank you, Dean. Well, thank you all for coming today. It's just wonderful to see so many of you that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, in the basement of the home up in the hills, uh, my father kept a wood shop. And for a time, he was a devoted woodworker. And he taped a few lines of verse by Longfellow on the door of the wood shop down in the basement. And these might well serve as his epitaph. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with greatest care each minute and unseen part, for the gods are everywhere. This tells you at least two things about my father. First, he was the kind of guy who would tape a poem to the door of his wood shop. He had a sense of style and a great appreciation for poetry, literature, music, derived from several sources. From his father, S.J., a man who never went beyond eighth grade but declaimed Shakespeare in the family living room. From his experience in the New York public schools, he would frequently sing for us such edifying music class ditties as this is the symphony that Schubert wrote and never finished. This is the theme in D that's played by violins and celli, the celli. From his beloved brother Mort and his college cronies in the crap poker and hot air society, and from a lifetime immersed in reading, listening, living the life of the mind, he would often say regretfully that we can only dip our teacups into the vast sea of human knowledge. The second thing the poem tells you is that he focused on what he was doing and getting it right. He was a bit accident prone, and partly he may have just been trying to remind himself not to saw his arm off in there. He taped tea bags to the kitchen stove exhaust vent to present him, prevent himself from continually bumping his head on the vent. But whatever Sandy did, he did with a certain kind of methodical passion. Woodworking was not just woodworking. It called for the judicious but liberal application of discretionary income in the form of acquiring a library of woodworking books, a stock of woodworking tools, a supply of high quality hardwoods. He joined a local wood shop and took lessons there. I'm sure he became good friends with the shop owner and the fellow woodworkers. And so it was with music. He took up playing the recorder, purchased a few thousand dollars worth of music and instruments, took a class in making recorders, actually produced one, joined various groups to rehearse and perform music, and played trios with Lisa and myself uh, frequently. He was an extremely enthusiastic player, although he did have a tendency to rush. Other interests included bike riding, bird watching, skiing, golf, cooking, squash, to all of which, and to life in general, he applied the same combination of method and passion. 
coffee, for some reason, had to be ground for something like exactly 24 seconds, and he would stand there with his watch, timing it. Every night before teaching a class, he would read the cases for the next day. It didn't matter that he'd read them 50 times before. They needed to be read because the gods are everywhere. One thing the poem doesn't tell you about Sandy is his sociability. Most of his pursuits could be exercised in a solitary fashion, but that was not his manner. Whether he was riding a bike or watching a bird, he did it with other people. I think this surprised even him. He once uh, you know, remarked to me about his beloved helper, Rhonda, I never dreamed that one of my best friends would turn out to be a middle-aged African-American nurse. He was just so connected with, with a huge variety of people. Since his death, I've heard from so many people about how beloved he was, how helpful to them, how he mentored them, he kept them from dropping out of law school, whether it was his gardener, his insurance agent, his nephrologist, whoever, the inevitable reaction was, oh, Sandy was such a wonderful man. He was really our favorite customer teacher, etc." How did he get to be so damn beloved? As his elder son, I didn't always appreciate that part, although I'd hasten to say we were extremely close. But it is apparent that the world at large loved Sandy. He took time for people, took an interest in them. As he became older and less caught up in his work, he became even more lovable. Some credit is due here to my wife, Lisa, a clinical psychologist who knew and loved Sandy well for 48 years. They had a mutually gratifying relationship he artfully educating her about the merits of philosophy and history, and she striving to increase what in modern parlance might be called his emotional intelligence. <laughs> to Sandy's credit, he regularly sought out and welcomed her counsel on how to handle challenging professional and personal relationships, another example of his passion to expand his horizons. His early background was not one that would necessarily uh, confer a high degree of emotional intelligence. As the dean said, he grew up in the Bronx, poor during the Depression. I previously mentioned his father, S.J., an intensely unhappy man who had to leave school after eighth grade because his father abandoned the family and ran off to Philadelphia to marry another woman. S.J.'s father neglected to obtain a divorce from the first wife uh, who tracked the father down and had him prosecuted for bigamy and thrown in jail. I believe this explains my father's early interest in criminal law. <laughs> Sandy's mother, Fano, was a lovely woman, uh, and I think Sandy got all of his warmth uh, from her. She was a very warm person, uh, but she had her hands full trying to hold the family together in times of real poverty. Many of Sandy's early stories involve onion sandwiches, terrible apartments, being farmed out to relatives, stickball in the street. Whether as a result of this or some genetic predisposition, Sandy was tough and resilient. His older brother, Mort, was the sensitive one, famous for having S.J. break a violin over his head. <laughs> Sandy was the rugged one, famous for running into a brick wall and breaking his nose. Sandy's, Sandy's family nickname was Dutch, based upon his early taste for beer. One of the wise guy uncles predicted, Morty? you grow up to be a professor. Sandy, you are going to be a truck driver. <laughs> I will at this point do what Sandy called in conversation dropping a footnote. He did indeed like beer, and he also had the habit of breaking into song whether or not the occasion called for it. So if you asked him what did he want to drink for dinner, he was likely to respond with, beer, 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 said the sailor. And if you wanted uh, to ask, if you asked him what he wanted for lunch, he would say, I want a sandwich, make it a tuna fish. <laughs> End of footnote. Like most of his impoverished New York's Jewish intellectual cohort, as the dean said, he went to City College. He would regale us from time to time with the fight song. City College, full from knowledge, hit him in the kishkas, sis boom ba. <laughs> Kishkas is non-genteel Yiddish for guts. Uh, then came the war, as Dean mentioned. He floated around the Pacific on a destroyer. He spent time in occupied Tokyo, where he provided translation services for his fellow sailors when they were visiting local bordellos. 
He always maintained that he sat in the parlor conversing with the madam and improving his Japanese. <laughs> he used these skills later in forging connections with Japanese law schools. He also enjoyed ordering in Japanese at Japanese restaurants, although he was frequently disappointed to learn the place was run by Koreans who had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> So the big fork in the road came a few years after law school. As he told the story, he was sitting in his office at his small uh, Manhattan labor firm, unhappily employed, when he received a call from Spence Kimball, one of his old war buddies, saying, Kadish, I'm starting this law school. Why don't you come help out? So there is the choice. Do you stay in New York? It's the only place you've ever lived. Be a lawyer. Live in the city. Home to your friends, your family, everything that's familiar to you. Or... Do you load your family, including a three-month-old child, into a 1950 Plymouth and drive a few thousand miles at 50 miles an hour to some place called Utah, where you don't know anybody but Kimball, to take on a job you have never done before and you have no idea you might be good at? Well, we know which one he chose, but what an astounding leap into the unknown. My mother, June, was a willing accomplice, and although the move had real costs for her, I'd say on the whole, she came out well on the deal. Pap was a hands-on father as 50s fathers went. He worked at least six days a week and most evenings, but some of his work was at home. I remember the first draft of the casebook, this mass of papers spread out on every surface around his study. He had a study in every house that we ever lived in. He had what in Yiddish is called zitzfleisch, which means the ability to plant your butt in a chair until the work is done. But he always made time for family in his methodical way. In the Utah years, every Sunday in winter, we would ski up at Brighton. Every Sunday in summer, it was horseback riding. We lived at the edge of town, and two blocks away were the stables. We would rent two horses, go riding off into the Wasatch Mountains for a few hours to our secret hideout. Not bad for a boy from the Bronx. He took up golf, and I would accompany him as his caddy. He cut my hair until one memorably bad haircut. As I grew, he edited my papers, became my squash partner, provided advice. I hung around his law school office after school, did homework there, bummed a ride home with him. When I was a young lawyer, I would frequently call him up to ask him about some legal or ethical issue. What a secret weapon to have at your disposal as a young lawyer. Even if he knew nothing about the legal issue in question, he could always uh, help me think my way through it because he had such a shrewd sense of what the law probably was. So I finally want to talk just a little bit about Sandy's relationship with my three sons. He was a very devoted grandfather, closely following their progress from babyhood to grad schools. So Nathan recalls Sandy encouraging him and his brothers to order french fries at Meals Out so that he could sneak a few of them when Grandma June was not looking. <laughs> Pap was a very playful person, horsed around with the kids, carrying nothing for decorum. We once encountered a plum tree from which the fruit was dropping. He was using a cane at the time and employed it as a baseball bat to send the plums flying. I recall him threatening to drop an ice cream cone on Nathan's head, creating quite a ruckus in an ice cream shop. While waiting online, he was likely to challenge the nearest kid to a bout of what he called Indian wrestling. Nathan further recalled driving once in France with the family and Pap sitting in the front. Pap opened up a beer and started to drink it. We observed that this activity was likely illegal even in France. For years afterward, oh, well, he, he countered with an extended argument that such activity fell within the spirit of the law. <laughs> and for years afterward, this debate would resurface, whether some clearly illegal activity fell within the spirit of the law. We were never quite sure what he meant by this or whether he took his own argument seriously. Maybe he just wanted a beer but didn't want to set a bad example. He enjoyed playful deception. He was famous for making up definitions to words that nobody knew just for the fun of seeing if he could get away with it. He once convinced Seth that everyone knew him, even the parking attendants at a football game who mysteriously waved him through. Turns out he was displaying a parking pass that Seth just could not see. He was a huge storyteller, mostly regarding his many unfortunate encounters with the natural world bears, skunks, rafts, crevasses, and his natural aversions of disaster. 
He told stories with greater animation and humor. He was a man who laughed a lot. Jonathan recalls him coming down to breakfast one morning and saying, Jonathan, I'm in love with the Mini. Referring, of course, to the Mini Cooper, which was his 90th birthday present to himself and the last in a long line of sports cars. John notes that Pap delighted in keeping up with technology and was an early iPod adopter. He welcomed help from the kids, and John recalls that this was his own earliest experience in teaching. John also loved how Pap would joke with waiters, telling faculty club ma maitre d' that his me membership number was 007. <laughs> so to close, Seth forwarded me some of his emails from Pap. Here's a representative section of one of these emails commenting on Seth's essay for a college religion class. You are more impressed than I am by the perdurability of the belief in God in human society. Just as Darwin puts much of the design argument in doubt, so does Freud, or rather the study of human psychology, cast doubt on the human need to believe in God's existence as a reason to believe it. The will to believe, Henry James here, does not prove the truth of the belief at all. This just doesn't strike me as your typical grandfather to grandson email. <laughs> Or finally, and this is so characteristic, strange dogs, A and B, are drowning, and only one person can save only one of the dogs. That person is you. If you knew just that dog A is smarter than dog B, would that make any difference in your choice of which to save? <laughs> Pap was constantly posing these kinds of questions at the dinner table, challenging us to think in philosophical ways. He enjoyed pushing people to think, and we always relished this. He leaves the impression that his life was one long, interesting conversation. So that's where I will end. I hope these words do our beloved Pap some justice. The gods are everywhere. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'd now like to welcome Peter Kadish uh, to the podium. Uh, Peter was born in Utah. Uh, raised in Berkeley, and returned to Utah, uh, where he and his family are members of the Brigham Young University community, where Peter works as a program administrator. Uh, Peter holds a degree in psychology and is married to Sandy. Kadish, but a different Sandy. <laughs> um, and they are here with their children, Jeremy, Christy, Emily, and Andrea. Welcome. Peter, please. Thank you, Dean. It's an honor to be here. It's a, a time and opportunity that I've known is coming for a long time. Uh, it beca this became more real a few years ago when my mother passed away and, and we had the same similar opportunity, but a different talk to give. Uh, th this time it's been a little different in my preparation to how I wanted to approach what I wanted to say, what I wanted to share. I did a lot of researching, looking up articles and law reviews that I've never had my nose in. It's, it's just, I'm not a lawyer, haven't studied law. I was a police officer for 10 years, that about as close as I could get to that. Um, but in my reading, I found articles uh, written by Jesse Choper and other beloved friends and colleagues of his. And it's all the same. It's, it's, it, they're all full of praise and honor and respect, things that they're just gushing. Uh, I didn't want to talk about his, his achievements and his honors and his certificates. That's been brought up all the time. Everybody's familiar with it. The list is this long. But I wanted to spend my time in preparation, first of all, in thanks, because 
Our father was a compilation of, of so much that he took in, as Josh referred to. He, he was like a sponge. He just soaked up knowledge and relationships and information for 93 years, nonstop. He never stopped learning, stopped observing, building relationships wherever he went. He was always actively involved in everything and with everyone. It's that kind of person that, that I wanted to take just a few minutes to honor and, and make reference to. Uh, I had a lot of thoughts that I wanted to share. I thought about making lists with bullet points, uh, things to talk about. But a lot of that attention was distracted by the program that, that I wanted to put together for him. Uh, I spoke with, with my dad about how, it was done, how we did it for my mother. And I said, I'd like to do one similar for you, if that's OK but make it more geared to you and not the same thing, but complimentary. And he said, that would be fine. So that was the first thing I knew I had to do that. Uh, so last week I began, uh, but it came together thanks to much help from others. Uh, the picture display out, out front began with primarily my father's interests as a uh, as a hobbyist photographer. Many of those pictures, most of those pictures in the early years were taken by him, or he'd hand the camera off to my mother, I suppose, and she took a lot. And I picked up that same interest later on, and I continued, and so you'll see beginning on one end of that display was his work, and then uh, a mix of both of ours, and then it, mine at the end primarily, but it was way to try to capture his lifestyle in a way you could, all of you could look at things from a different point of view. Um, here at the law school, it's all academic. Uh, from my point of view, it's, it's my dad. I didn't, I didn't want to get emotional here. Um, but I never really knew and appreciated him for what most of you know him for. Aside from the, the human characteristics of, of kindness and just the human warm things. Uh, but I, I knew him from being, being the dad that went off to work each day. Uh, as I've made reference to to several of you, I knew many of the faculty from from law school from the 60s and 70s. I knew where their offices were in the old wings of the law school. Uh, as a little kid, I would just make myself home when I'd take the bus and come visit him. I'd walk through the hallways. I knew people. They went to faculty parties. Uh, you were like family. And that's one of the sides that I knew him from. So I don't have a lot to add to what's been said. Josh covered it extremely well. Many of you have introduced yourselves and shared other stories. Everybody has a story about him. And it's like a book that's being continually written. I'm honored to have had a part of it and to share it with others. I'm grateful for all of you for being a part of that story. And I'll... Uh, turn over the rest of the time to the dean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Tamara Lev uh, to come to approach the podium. Uh, Tamara is currently an associate professor of law at the University of Miami, where she teaches criminal law, ethics, and law and philosophy. Uh, Tamara was one of Sandy's mentees, and she came to Berkeley in 2005 as a doctoral candidate in the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program. In 2005, 
I left the glitz and glamour of the San Diego County Public Defender's Office to embark on a PhD in jurisprudence and social policy here at UC Berkeley. When I was selecting my classes for that first semester, one in particular stood out. It was called Matters of Life and Death, Moral Reasoning and the Law, taught by Professor Emeritus Samford Kadish and Dr. Sadaf Saeed. My father, then an economist at Carnegie Mellon University, cautioned against it. He advised me to choose classes taught by people I would be able to build a relationship with, and he thought that was extremely unlikely with a professor emeritus. Despite the wisdom of my father's advice, my gut told me otherwise. I'd given up a lot to attend graduate school, and so I felt I deserved to take courses that genuinely interested me. With the strong encouragement of both Frank Zimring and Margot Rodriguez, I enrolled in Sandy's course. And thrill me, it did. Every week we wrestled over a new issue, self-defense, defective newborns, abortion and euthanasia, to name a few. Sandy and Sad sat in the front asking us questions, pushing us to think through things more deeply. Sandy would often have to chide us not to fight the hypothetical. Although I have always been pro-choice, Sandy's class was the first time that I had really considered the other side. I could tell that some of the other women students in the class thought that I was conservative because I articulated the force of the right to life perspective. But I didn't mind. Sandy and Sad created a safe space within those classroom walls. One where it didn't matter what outcome we came to, just that we were willing to deeply engage with the material. Every week we were assigned a short essay about the readings. On a trip to Rochester, New York for a friend's wedding, I had a group of, friend, I had a group of friends debating the merits of whether it was ethical to push a fat person on the track to stop a trolley so that it wouldn't kill several people, one versus the many. It was a gas, and despite the fact that my friends were hungover, they launched into the conversation with great uh, gusto. So let me share an assignment. I, like Josh, went back over my nine years worth of emails between myself and Sandy. There were many, but I just want to share one of the assignments to give you a touch of what it was like having Sandy as a professor. Friends, sorry I'm a touch late. Your responses at the last session made us rethink the assignment we had in mind. That's because many of you flummoxed us by your readiness to approve a practice of killing uninvolved, innocent, non-consenting people if that would increase the probable, probable statistical longevity of the rest of the population. You're the first class in my experience to do that. If you really believe that, it will make the trolley case a no-brainer. So to deal with those who buy Harrison principle and those who don't, here's the question on the first of Thompson's trolley articles. And here's the question. Thompson finds the transplant morally unacceptable, but not the trolley. She offers a line of argument to justify her defining positions by distinguishing the two cases. How far does she succeed? At the end of the semester, Sandy and June had the class over their house in the Berkeley Hills. We drank wine and ate slabs of cheese with crackers. At the end of the evening, Sandy told us all that he would be happy to have lunch with us. I waited what seemed like an appropriate amount of time, which was probably a day, and then sent him an email and asked him if we could have lunch, and thus began our friendship. We met at least once every two weeks, often more, sometimes less. Saul's was a favorite of mine, but Sandy said that Jesse Choper always chose Saul's, so he insisted on going someplace else. We visited restaurants in Berkeley, some little haunts that Sandy knew about, and on Solana Avenue. But usually, we went to the women's faculty club. Sandy always delighted in telling the person who sat us his faculty ID number, which as Josh, which, which as Josh has always told you, excuse me, which, is jo which as Josh has already told you, was 007. Sandy usually ordered the same thing, sparkling water, through an omelet with two eggs instead of three, in deference to June, I think, and a black coffee. Unless one of us had an appointment, we often closed down the place. Sometimes we had something on the agenda, 
an article that Sandy had sent to discuss a chapter of my dissertation, and then when I was teaching, advice on teaching mens rea or some other topic of criminal law. But that often we just talked about life, religion, love, Shakespeare. Although Sandy was in his late 80s when I met him, he always impressed me with his curiosity and zest for life. When, K when Kinch Hookstra and I devised a plan to get Sandy on the back of Kinch's motorcycle, Sandy was game. He audited courses. Some of my favorite memories are walking to and from Sam Scheffler's global, global justice class with Sarah Song and Sandy. Sandy and I also both audited the Scheffler Rakowski seminar and Kinch and Chris Kutz's seminar, Chris Kutz's seminar on War and Peace. Sandy was also extremely funny. One year he gave me a book for the holidays. The book was entitled Fabulous Small Jews. This is his inscription. <laughs> Xmas 07 for Tamara. Semi Jews can be fabulous too. You, for example, Sandy. <laughs> But Sandy wasn't just energetic and curious, he was also kind and supportive. In one memorable email exchange, I wrote Sandy to lament that I had asked what I perceived to be a stupid question at one of the Gala lectures. And let me just say, it was a speaker who I had great respect for. I had brought all my books on Kant and I was ready to ask the question and she wasn't very sympathetic to me, or she wasn't very receptive to my question. I end up feeling idiotic. So I wrote Sandy, after actually Chris had been very kind to me at, the, at this lecture, but I, I wrote to Sandy, and this is his response. Ah, Tamara, there are a few memories more ephemeral than who said what at faculty seminars, <laughs> even if it be faculty meetings. Abe Lincoln once said, you remember that the world will little note nor long remember his words at Gettysburg. He happened to be wrong. But he would have been right if he said them at law school colloquiums. <laughs> That's my point one. My point two is this. If you are going to replay and obsess over your performance at academic events, your professorial lot will be less happy than it ought to be and will not be a better one for all the fretting. Take a run and forget about it. My point three is whatever was the comment you made that you're referring to. Sandy was one of the first people that I confided in about my dissolving marriage, and he was one of the first that I sought out advice upon when I was considering having a baby on my own. Despite the fact that Sandy had lived a much more conventional life, marrying his beloved June and staying with her for some 60 odd years, he didn't seem remotely taken aback by the idea of my unconventional family. I never felt anything but supported and loved. Sandy lost June a few months before my father died of cancer in 2011. When Sandy became extremely ill and was hospitalized soon after June's death, I couldn't bear the thought of him dying. It would have simply been too much loss. Every time I would return to Berkeley for a visit, I would always reach out to Sandy to arrange a lunch and or a dinner. On this last trip over Labor Day weekend, Sandy did not respond to any of my emails, which became more and more frantic as my visit approached. Two days before I was scheduled to depart, Josh called. I didn't pick up because I was supposed to teach in an hour, and I was afraid that he would tell me that Sandy had died. After class, I called back Josh, who told me that he thought that the end was near. Of course, I was sad, but I was very happy that I would be there that weekend to see him one last time. I saw Sandy every day during that visit, and although Sandy seemed his usual self on Friday, as we bantered back and forth about Shakespeare, arguing about the words to Macbeth, by the time I said goodbye to Sandy on Monday morning, en route to the airport, I cried knowing that it would be the last time. Sandy Kadish, respected professor, valued mentor, and beloved friend. All I can say is, 
thank goodness I didn't listen to my father. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is my colleague David Lieberman, who is the James and Isabel Coffrith Professor of Jurisprudence and a Professor of History. He came to Berkeley in 1984. Uh, he formerly served as Associate Dean of the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program and was Faculty Director of the Cater Center. David. Thank you. I can recall several previous occasions when I faced the then purely happy task of detailing Sandy Kadish, Kadish's remarkable achievements and contributions. Over 10 years ago, there was a formal, appropriately pompous bells and whistles introduction that preceded Sandy's address as guest speaker at an undergraduate legal studies commencement on the Cal campus. Two years ago, there was the gentle teasing of a celebratory toast at the dedication of the Sanford H. Kadish Library at the JSP building at 2240 Piedmont. Only a few months before, there was a much more careful review of Sandy's towering scholarship that formed the major part of my preparation for a lengthy public interview with Sandy, hosted and archived now by the Berkeley Center for the Study of Law and Society. On each of these occasions, the easy part was chronicling the imposing record of distinction and leadership that comprised such a steady feature of Sandy's career. The honorary degrees, the visiting appointments, the named lectures, the prestigious fellowships, the celebrated contributions, the study and teaching of criminal law, the leadership offices in professional associations, the creation with June of the Berkeley of Berkeley Law's Kadish Center for Morality, Law, and Public Affairs, the co-founding with Philip Selznick of the PhD program in jurisprudence and social policy, and of course, the deanship of his beloved Bolt Hall School of Law. The record is in equal measure dazzling and intimidating. His was a life of rich accomplishment and realization. Yet it was not these successes that made Sandy such a profound and abiding presence in our lives, nor I believe which makes his memorial such a powerful moment for collective gratitude and loss. Rather, what so moves us now is the recalled pleasures of his company, his singular gifts as teacher and mentor, colleague and ally, all too insightful critic, and wonderfully generous friend. Sandy Kodish was a virtuoso of friendship and community. Taking the measure of his achievement is inevitably both a highly personal and a significantly communal task. What made Sandy such a cherished friend across such a range of relationships and across such a range of generations? Certainly, it was not the product of Sandy being all things to all people. As a scholar, he cultivated an analytically precise elaboration of the central moral challenges treated by the institutions of law, informed by a specific brand of mainstream Anglo-American philosophy and jurisprudence. He had little patience for work, no matter how fashionable, that he viewed as glib or self-indulgent or obscure. As an academic leader, he relied on what he termed a romantic ideal of the university, as well as a set of sturdy liberal New Deal principles forged in his own experience of a Depression-era childhood in New York City, which we have heard about, his successful navigation of that familiar route of upward academic mobility, an undergraduate career at New York City College, wartime service with the Navy, and a post-war educational and professional ecology of Jewish quotas and restricted horizons. As a faculty member at Berkeley, he took up his permanent appointment literally only weeks before the start of the free speech movement 
Sandy simply hated the violence and excesses of campus politics of the 1960s. In his deanship, a decade later, Sandy weathered divisions among and between faculty and students that were a legacy of the 60s and which found him frequently resisting demands for change. Yet what Sandy typically recalled from these years were not the endless committees or the embattled meetings or the strife, but the friendships and the community that survived the turmoil and the divisions. When asked about the discordant faculty meetings, Sandy would relay the story of how Bob Cole had presented him with the gift of gold cufflinks following a particularly heated and divisive session. Asked about the strain of being dean amidst sit-ins and personal attacks, Sandy would describe a surprise faculty celebration organized for June and him, designed, as he put it, to cheer up the dean, and attended, as he also put it, by everyone. When assessing his achievements as a scholar and as a leader, Sandy inevitably turned to people and relationships. His older brother and first mentor, Mort, with whom he co-authored Discretion to Disobey, the co-generation of young criminal law scholars who first named and addressed what he called the crisis of overcriminalization, the colleagues who convinced June and Sandy to leave Ann Arbor and make Berkeley their home for nearly half a century. Sandy's virtuosity for friendship drew effortlessly on his impish humor, his relish for enjoying the situation at hand, and his capacious sympathies. For all the accomplishment and distinction, all the success, there was no self-importance or false gravity in him. He was, of course, brilliant, and it could be painful to become the target of his acuity. I still recall with some dread a conversation decades ago which followed a visit by my elderly mother to our home in Berkeley. Sandy, how is your mother doing? Me, terrible. Within hours of her arrival, she tripped over a rolled up carpet in the hallway. She spent the visit icing her bruises and had to go to the hospital for x-rays. Sandy, you left a carpet in the hallway? <laughs> Was it a dark carpet, a dark hallway? Me, well, not that dark. Any, anyway, it had been there for months, and no one ever tripped on it before. Sandy, and exactly how many 75-year-olds had been in the hallway during the period in question? It went downhill from there. Most of the time, Sandy made it much easier for all of us. For all his brilliance, he conducted himself with unstudied, unstudied humility and warmth, ever eager to know and how what one was doing, ready to encourage and support. This made him a terrific friend to younger colleagues and to graduate students, and as we know, an inspired grandfather and great-grandfather. Tamara eloquently described the profound Sandy had on those whose welfare became so important to him. In recent years, I used to tease Sandy that the house on Hillsdale Avenue had become a kind of mini Mecca, where former colleagues and students across generations would make their regular pilgrimages. It was a practice that literally continued up until the final hours of his life, when many, like Tamara, dropped everything to make a sudden even a cross-country trip to Mecca, simply for the sake of one more visit, one more conversation. Sandy always took greatest pride in the foundation of the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program during his period as dean. This is not the time or place to recount the detailed leadership that made possible to bring an academic PhD program to Bolt Hall when no such entity existed in the world of US legal education. 
But a word I think deserves to be said about the characteristic modesty and emphasis on personal connections in terms of which Sandy always described this particular achievement. He never, never spoke of JSP without paying homage to his comrade in arms, Philip Selznick. They were, of course, a formidable team, and their friendship, mutual admiration, and shared legacy extend well beyond this specific academic program. Sandy invariably gave Philip the lion's share of credit for the academic vision behind JSP. Describing his own contribution in self deprecating terms as housekeeping. In fact, Sandy had a clear and expressed vision for JSP, drawn less on Philip's hopes for the cultivation of a distinctive brand of interdisciplinary study of legal institutions and values, and more on the specific potential of this study for the legal academy itself. JSP, he later reported, was the opportunity of the century. The doctoral program would help expand the intellectual horizons of the law school, stimulate legal research to engage larger and more fundamental questions, and provide a bridge to new collaborations and conversations with Berkeley's great research departments in the humanities and the social sciences. The agenda spoke volumes about the aspirations and convictions of Sandy's own scholarship and writing, and to his hopes for Berkeley Law's future. The goals were lofty, but the housekeeper, housekeeper remained humble. At one point in my 2012 interview with Sandy, he playfully noted, you know, you carry your past behind you, no matter how far you go. This occasion is a powerful, if melancholy, reminder of just how much richer our collective pasts were and our futures now are, thanks to Sandy Kadish. In thinking about Sandy now, and I have frequently done so in the recent weeks, I readily recall the endless pleasure of Sandy, and especially of June and Sandy's company, extended so often, first to me, and soon after to my wife, Carol, and then to our children. I am frankly overwhelmed by the simple fact of Sandy's companionship and affection. It was and remains a wonderful blessing, received amidst so many others who likewise were enriched by his gifts and his love. Thank you. Our last speaker today is Jesse Choper, um, a longtime law school colleague of Sandy's um, who was dean himself. Jesse is the Earl Warren Professor of Public Law at Berkeley, uh, which he joined in 1965. He served as law clerk to Chief Justice Earl Warren after graduation from the law school at the University of Pennsylvania. Jesse. Excuse me. Sandy was the wisest person I've ever known and my closest friend at Berkeley for 50 years. I loved him uh, like the older brother I never had, and he like the younger brother that he never had. I have often thought that the occasion of a memorial would arise. I always hoped it wouldn't happen and that it would be a very long time in coming, and <clears throat> that he would be here today, and not me. <laughs> Excuse me. But the time has come. Sandy was an exceptional friend to a significant number of our faculty, young and old. He made it a point to meet new members and had periodic lunches with many, and as you've heard, the talk was almost always on some serious substantive topic. Similarly, 
He was a special person to many others that he'd met in different places over the years. Many in both groups, as has been mentioned, came to his home during his last days. <coughs> that was quite a tribute. Sandy's professional accomplishments are widely known and many have been rehearsed here, so let me just capture a few that I, I, I don't think have been made. He was one of the four or five most preeminent scholars in the history of this law school. He was the foremost path-breaking criminal law theorist of his time in this country. He was the only person from Bolt Hall ever to have been selected to be the Berkeley campus, <coughs> excuse me, faculty research lecturer, the highest academic honor granted to anyone on the Berkeley faculty. Prior recipients include uh, such luminaries as Ernest Lawrence, Glenn Seaborg, Louis Alvarez, Charlie Towns, all winners of the Nobel Prize. He was the first person ever to serve in both the capacities that have been mentioned as president of both the AAUP and the ALS, and thrown in for good measure, he was also a vice president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was accorded the signal honor of election as a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. I quote, the highest honor that the Academy is able to confer is a mark of scholarly distinction to non-United Kingdom residents who've attained high international standing in the humanities. At the time, there were fewer than 100 such fellows in the United States and less than a dozen in law. Everyone has spoken about uh, his, uh, his being at the creation, participating in the creation of the JSP program, and, and uh, I, uh, uh, I won't repeat that uh, here. You know, there, there is much, much more. You've, you've heard much of it already. But uh, let, let this suffice for the academic record. Because for me to describe just some of Sandy's many other selves, even those that I know about, would take a long, long time, but I, I'll give you, in any event, a snapshot. I first met Sandy in St. Louis in December of 1959 at the annual law school convention. <clears throat> I was a third year law student interviewing for a teaching job, and he was one of the interviews of the Utah law faculty, although he was then on his way to become a visiting professor at Harvard. We very quickly felt a mutual affinity and we met and discussed things at several subsequent law school conventions during the four years that I was teaching in Minnesota. Sandy went on to teach at Michigan from Harvard and was a visiting professor at Berkeley in January of 65 when I came uh, to Bolt to interview for a job. Once again, he was an interviewer, but mainly he was a recruiter. He made clear to me that he decided to moved to Berkeley from Michigan. And um, I just as a, as a footnote, this decision, as has been mentioned, was just uh, months after the beginning of the tumultuous period of the free speech movement. Uh, and uh, one waggish observation of a mutual friend of ours from Stanford at the time was that Sandy, quote, was the rat that boarded the sinking ship. <laughs> Sandy urged me at the time to become his colleague here, uh, and I did. Uh, a, a decision, I should say, that I have never once in regretted uh, that the half century I've been here. So our special friendship begins, regularly getting together at work and often as, as guests in each other's home. The time I, one time I remember especially well was when we celebrated our first Thanksgiving uh, at, uh, uh, at the, in Berkeley uh, with Sandy in June. As I uh, drove us through the Berkeley Hills, the streets were somewhat slippery because of a light snow that it had fallen. As I was going, I kept visualizing. It was just coming from where I was. It was difficult. It was how difficult it was going to be to maneuver these hills after a heavy snowfall had come. <laughs> he, 
He assured me, however, uh, that this was not like Minnesota and that this weather almost never occurs and as usual, uh, he was right. Sandy loved life to the fullest as you've heard, always reaching to explore new subjects, beginning just for example with moral philosophy and more recently learning how to take uh, advantage uh, of the new technology. I always uh, admired his breadth, but his, his range was much wider than the life of the mind, and you've heard some of that. Uh, one major event was mentioned was woodworking. And he, I tell you, he was, he was really good at that. One visible result may still be seen in the law school. It's the wall of mailboxes in the passageway leading to the dean's seminar room. He made them from scratch in his uh, basement wood shop that Josh expounded about. He loved music uh, a great deal, not just as a regular listener and a concert goer. I, I always examined, uh, uh, admired the fact he learned to play this recorder. But when he did, I mean, this was a serious enterprise for him. He took lessons, he practiced with great determination, he played it together with a small group of other people uh, that uh, had different instruments. And uh, he even went, uh, Peter pointed this out to me, he went to his wood shop and handmade a recorder uh, for himself. Uh, Sandy was also, this was not mentioned, he was a fairly good athlete. Uh, he became a dedicated skier, probably the product of his being at Utah, because I don't think they had any ski slopes in the Bronx. Uh, and he, he also played third base in our annual uh, faculty law review softball game. But as was mentioned, bicycling, I think, was the principal form of exercise over many years. He used to ride long distances up and down the, uh, the, the hills in, in Tilden Park. I joined him once in a while. I, I came home, you know, spent, totally exhausted. Um, and uh, he also, this was not mentioned, liked to gamble. Um, organizing and often uh, hosting poker games with faculty friends, new and old. He was a very shrewd poker player. Jan and Ed Hallback, uh, the Kadishes and the Chopers, made several trips to Las Vegas uh, to play at the tables. He even went to the races with me one day. But to my lasting regret, I could never uh, interest him in it uh, coming back uh, again. His relish of uh, living persisted through later years. He wanted, he, he enjoyed life. Mari and I had a large group of his friends, I think over a, a hundred people for a party at our home to celebrate his 80th birthday. As I toasted him on the occasion, I told him that we planned a repeat performance uh, for his 90th birthday. Well, time went on and several months before he turned 90, he came and reminded me <laughs> of, uh, of my promise. So our 90th birthday for him took place a little over three years ago. And during my congratulation remarks, uh, I renewed our commitment, this time for his 95th. So the he immediately popped up. Why just five years? <laughs> I confess I had no clever response uh, to, to that. Uh, as has been mentioned, no celebration of Sandy's long and good life would be accurate without strongly emphasizing the role played by June uh, for 68 years. Uh, put simply, she kept him in line, especially in respect to his health. And this was well before he developed some heart problems about 30 years ago. Uh, June had been a longtime home economist in the Berkeley Co-op. She took this job very seriously. In fact, I was told she was known for going to customers' carts and removing items. <laughs> that, that she thought that they thought they were you know, badly chosen. Beginning a long time ago, when the four of us had dinner together and Sandy uh, out, out someplace at a restaurant, he was about to choose something that she disapproved of, I can still hear 
the admonition I heard many times, quote, Sanford Harold, you know better than that. <laughs> and Sam, Sandy simply didn't order what she wanted. Um, although, uh, when we dined together periodically, uh, with a promise in blood that I wouldn't tell June, uh, he departed uh, from the system a little bit. After June was gone, Sandy and I got together. When we did, he usually inqu inquired of one another, you know, how are things going? O older people uh, talk about that as a, the beginning of, a, of an organ recital. <laughs> that, you'll think about that for a minute, you'll get it. <laughs> At some point, I should say, in his response as to how he was doing, he almost always would say, I miss June. But he was not Pollyannish about the subject of mortality. During the last couple of years, Sandy become a bit forgetful. What a surprise. After he missed one of our dinner dates, I took to sending him an email requesting confirmation send that usually on the morning of our planned meeting. And he ordinarily responded by mid-afternoon at the latest. On several occasions, I had exhausted, when I had exhausted the usual methods of getting in touch with him, I would call Alta Bates Hospital. A couple of times, that's where I found him. But this time, about a month ago, it now was after five o'clock, he was not in hospital either. After a long series of uh, left emails and telephone messages at his home, uh, he finally called. He f casually explained that he was out running errands or doing something like that. So when we met that evening for dinner and ordered the dinner, I told him what had happened that afternoon, complaining to him about uh, not responding. He thought for a moment, and then he said to me, in, just the, in, in the calmest and gentlest tone imaginable, he said something very close to this. Jesse, I know how much you care about me, and I really appreciate it. But my dear friend, one of these days before too long, I'm going to die. <coughs> I am not afraid of that. I'm ready for it. So please. Don't worry about me the way you've been doing. I, <coughs> I simply told him that I understood. Sandy and I didn't agree on everything, but we did most see most things in a very similar fashion. With one major exception. Both of us were Jewish, as been indicated, and so identified ourselves, but neither of us had been observant Jews uh, during our adult lives. I don't think he ever had been an, an observant Jew. Uh, but there we parted. Although we agreed that a great deal of evil had been done in the name of religion, I was a strong proponent of religious freedom. He felt it should be quite limited. I was an agnostic. Sandy was a resolute atheist. And over the years, there was no bridging that gap. So goodbye, Sandy. Who knows? Maybe someday, someplace, we'll find each other again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're grateful that you've all come to celebrate the life and achievements of Sandy Kadish. And please join us uh, for a reception as we continue to celebrate Sandy's life. Thank you. <laughs>